We'll get going. Um, Hilary, you're super, super welcome. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here on the podcast. Um, personally, I've, the research I've been doing as part of my own dissertation delved into a lot of the research you did on leadership. And we're going to talk about that later, uh, women in leadership, but also just lead, guiding choirs and the, the, the stuff that maybe it's harder to teach when it comes to conducting programs. Um, which of course you've got wonderful methodologies and ways of, of framing things. Um, so I guess for our listeners, um, if you'll bear with us, Hillary has quite an extensive biography um, and I think it's important to get a lot of this across because she really is um, a trailblazer and has been a trailblazer for choral music in the Americas. And I say the Americas because she's Canadian by birth. Um, and began her music education in Nova Scotia at the age of five. Her degrees are all in vocal music education and are from the University of Toronto, University of Illinois, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she also has a diploma in piano performance from the Royal Conservative Music in Toronto. She was the director of choral activities at Ohio University from 1993 to 2010, and she was also associate director of the School of Music from 2008 to 2010. Um, her choirs have performed at ACDA's regional and national. She was also president of the ACDA, um, and they have performed at National Association of Music Education Conferences. She's conducted honors choirs and all state choirs all around the entire United States and Canada. She's regularly invited to adjudicate. She's already invited to do workshops, clinics all around the US. And that was where I first met her. It was in California at a conference, and she was doing a master class. Um, guiding guiding young students and and conductors um, and she was also adjudicating um, giving feedback to choirs as they performed um, her research is really really fascinating there's various various things from choral repertoire to leadership styles she's published over 70 articles on choral music in various journals and has wrote have written two chapters in wisdom wit and will women conductors and their art which is a fantastic book I'm gonna for anyone looking at the video I'm gonna show the book here um, we're going to delve into that later. Um, she's on the editorial boards of the Choral Scholar, official publication of the National Collegiate Conductors Association organization. Um, she's also published in the ACD Choral Journal and um, is a choral column editor for the Canadian Music uh, Educator. Um, this list goes on forever, uh, um, but I think the, the final thing is to say that she is, is kind of bang smack within the development of choral music in America in probably what is the, the most fruitful time for choral music. Um, it appears that choral music is now at its peak, that it were beyond where it has ever been um, before, perhaps maybe the only time it was as common and, and as well um, uh, spread across the country was when everyone was going to church regularly. I'd say that was the last time people, choral music was really as big as as it is now. So Hilary, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here on the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be uh, here. I feel as if I should make two corrections. Please do. Um, well, I was at the Ohio State University. Ohio University is different, so some people might be a little offended if I claimed to have been there. When I oh, I said Ohio. Very good. Ohio State. And I'm not on the, on the Choral Scholar editorial board. It's the Choral Journal. Oh, okay. I might have been at one time, but that it's a while ago. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I think that we'll have to contact DCNIY, that company, because yeah. they, they appear to have you on the editorial board of the Choral Scholar. So we'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll reach out to oh, them. That would be lovely, but... <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I guess, firstly, you know, as a woman in the US, um, where um, choral music was so dominated by male figures for quite a long time. You are within the echelon of these wonderful female conductors in the Americas. Um, who was your inspiration when you first got into conducting? How did you, did you always want to be a conductor? Did you want to be a teacher? What got you on the path to, to where you are now? I did want to be a teacher for a long time. My parents were both trained as teachers. Um, I think in high school, I had this fabulous orchestra conductor teacher, John McDougall. Um, he's still alive and I saw him about two years ago. He's going strong. He was probably the biggest influence. There were a number of us in that year who went into music. Um, but it really wasn't until I got into university that conducting, that bug sort of bit me. I had always been in choirs from the time I was five, but I didn't really think about leading them. 
I just thought, oh, I'd like to be a music teacher. And then everything sort of coalesced, coalesced when I was in, in university. I never had a female conducting teacher, but I had a wonderful music ed professor who at that time was young. She had a family. She was playing violin in a chamber orchestra in Toronto. She just seemed to be able to do everything. And I thought, I want to be like that when I grow up. Um, and I guess she would have been the biggest influence professionally as a female, because as I say, all the rest of my teachers were male. Um, I still have never studied with a, a female conducting teacher. Wow. I mean, there are lots of them out there. There are lots of us now, but you know, when I was in school, it, it was not so common. Um, you would see women would stay at the high school level and by stay, I don't mean that there's anything wrong with that, but they chose to be there. It seemed maybe they didn't have time to get advanced degrees or they were raising children, you know, who knows. Um, but it was very male dominated, as you said, and, and I see a big shift there now, which is encouraging. Yeah, it's fascinating because in, in Ireland, we just had uh, Bernie Sherlock on the podcast, who's a, a very famous Irish conductor. And it appears the choral world in Ireland is very much made up of female conductors. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, I think it comes from a lot of them perhaps were primary school teachers and they were conducting yes. and they were leading choirs. So there was great children's choirs came out of that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, but, but apparently in the orchestral world is where right. more so there, it is very male dominated, probably still is, is quite male dominated. Yes, I think it is very much. I think it's much harder to break through that ceiling than it is in choral. And one of the things Bernie brought up in um, when we were speaking to her was when she first stood in front of a professional orchestra, uh, she felt that she was being treated differently because she was a choral conductor. Yes. We'd love to just explore that a little bit to see if you, you've ever had a similar experience. Oh, definitely. Um, I had a couple. I remember one time I just finished part of a rehearsal. It was at break. It was here in, in Columbus, Ohio, where I'm living now. And uh, I was with the Brass Band of Columbus. And a gentleman, I think it was a trombone player, came up to me and he said, what instrument do you play? And I said, well, I, uh, I played violin, and I, but mostly I was a pianist when I was in school. And I said, why do you ask? And he said, oh, because you're so clear and easy to follow. <laughs> ah. <laughs> um, you know, he meant it as a compliment. I understand that now, but I thought, ugh. And I think unspoken was that assumption that if you're a choral conductor, you're going to be flowery. If you're a woman choral conductor, you're going to be super flowery and hard to follow. Um, but I have had a couple of instances of that. And I know sometimes standing on the podium, I feel as if I have to be extra good at what I'm doing in order for people to take me seriously. That's ridiculous, you know, it, but it, it has, it has undermined, I think, my confidence. I, I, I have felt that. And it's not until I get into it and I think, oh, this is going okay, I'm all right. But, but it still bothers me even now that, that I would feel that way. And Hilary, when you talk about that sort of flowery nature that comes from, you from working with choirs, what exactly do you mean? Because I'm sure everybody knows that they know what a conductor is, but a lot of people don't know what a conductor does. They, they, they uh, see it point. happening, but unless you sing in a choir, you don't feel it because it is a very, um, it's almost a tangible thing when you're right. singing with a conductor. So could you maybe explain, especially what you mean by maybe the, the assumption that you're being flowery? What does that entail? Well, first of all, as background, I think there are two things. I think there's an assumption that a choral conductor is flowery, and I think there's an assumption that a female is. And by that, I mean, you know, lots of very smooth gestures. There was a time way back when, when choral conductors would show the melodic rhythm oftentimes, um, particularly working with children, and you would see them showing them melodic direction, this kind of thing you just don't see that happen. I mean, we're all taught the same way, we're all taught the same beat patterns, everything else. Um, it's much more sophisticated now, but I think it's a holdover from that, that it, it came from that era. Also the notion that we didn't use batons, of course we can use batons, but it developed over time, I think. And for some reason, it's, it, 
in some people's minds, it's still a misconception because there's plenty of proof, if you just look around, that that is not the case, that there's great clarity to be seen in regardless of gender. And there's great lack of clarity regardless of gender sometimes too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a lot of teachers, a lot of community uh, conductors that we would see in Ireland, I think, especially just from working with the festival um, that we set up in this year. The, there seems to be a lack of training and there, there is a dearth of courses and sort of third level courses. Now that's changing in Ireland now, that is becoming more of a common thing where people can actually train within Ireland in conducting and learn how to you know, go beyond the basic technique. But I think, especially in primary schools and even in secondary schools, the school wants to have a choir, but they don't have anyone who knows how to conduct. So the right. teacher just starts and learns and the students right. just learn how to do it. So And they learn how to follow, right? Yeah, and it's almost just a, a, a form of leadership versus a form of conduct, yeah. conducting technique. Right. Well, it's really, it's more like encouragement or cheerleading in a way. And lots of times we rely on our mouths. I used to teach elementary school too. And um, they always wanted me to have a choir. I was working with the classroom teachers and they didn't have a lot of background. So I would go in and I remember teaching the children, you know, when my hands do this, it means to breathe and I'll help you. And the teachers were sort of surprised because they thought, well, just open your mouth and mouth the words. And <laughs> they were surprised that the children could learn to follow something different. And I thought, well, let's just treat them as young musicians, which is what they are and see what happens. But I understand the lack of, of training. Yeah. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about gesture and, and, and more specific technique. But could you uh, could you explain a little how what, what the various forms of leadership are, even for someone who maybe works in a school or works in a, a, a high school or wants to sing and maybe sings in their local choir, but they might want to start something of themselves. So how do they go about that very first step of step standing in front of a group of singers? Mm -hmm. And like you, you talked about maybe a nonverbal form. I mean, nonverbal sounds easy, but it's very difficult to communicate nonverbally. It is difficult. Um, leadership is pretty complex. It's multifaceted. And when we're, we're teaching music, we're musicians. You know, we're scholars, we have to know our stuff. Um, we're teachers because there's a pedagogy involved and, and we're also leaders because leaders, good leaders get a group of people to, to agree um, to do certain things together. And um, I have noticed sometimes that, especially working with um, amateur singers, sometimes the best leaders are not necessarily the very best musical scholars. They are the people who have the, the enthusiasm, the ability to connect with people. Um, they know what they want to teach, but they, they are able to present it in such a way that it's, um, it's not fearful to the learners. And so with children, for example, you need to know enough about their voices to help them sing. You need to be able to engage them in some music, give them things to listen for, um, find songs that will engage them. You definitely need to know how for them to explore their voices. But in that kind of, oftentimes with kids, it's a playful thing. It's a kind of back and forth. But so much of it depends on your ability to engage with people. And to me, that's a key in leadership. It doesn't mean you have to be an extrovert. I am not an extrovert mm -hmm. by any means. Um, but you have to be really passionate about what you're doing. And in that way, you can often engage people. And often the best kind of the best choral leaders, whether it's in school or in a local choral society, they're the people who can identify the leaders amongst the group and exactly. facilitate them and get them to lead. And like you said, maybe they're not scholars, they're not the best, even the best singers sometimes, but some of the true. best leaders in the choir are the people who are going to, you know, bring their commitment and set yep. the tone, set the standards. So the leader as the conductor is actually mm -hmm. the facilitator of other Absolutely. leaders as well. Yeah, I think part of good leadership is being able to delegate, being able to identify the people who can do things sometimes better than you can and being able to bring them into the fold and kind of empowering them to be helpful. For example, um, in Canada, a lot of us who end up in choral music are not 
solo singers. I went through university as a pianist. I had voice lessons and I always sang in choir, but I was not what I would call a solo singer. And there were times when I was able to use a wonderful singer in a choir I had to demonstrate when I knew that they would do it better than I would. Um, it would have been ridiculous for me to try um, <laughs> when somebody was right there who could do it. And also I think that, that in that kind of leadership where you show that you trust other people, then they, they come to trust you better as well. It's it very much a collegial kind of thing. Absolutely. And being able to hand over the mantle, for example, if you have a German in your choir and, yes. you know, like we're going to work on a German piece to stand at the front with our, you know, our wonderful IPA and all these other things we have, yeah. but yeah. actually have a German person, you know, bring them up and let them listen to the choir and let them guide the choir through to the process. It's handing over the mantle inspires the people to, to give more to the choir and, and be part of it. Well, nobody can be an expert at everything and it's foolish mm -hmm. to try. Mm -hmm. So, and that isn't to say that you absolve yourself of responsibility. You're still making many of the key decisions, but it's, it's foolish not to use the skills and the abilities that people have. I always found when I had grad students from other countries, that was a prime time to teach music from that culture because who better would know it? Mm -hmm. And something that just came to me there, I think, which I think would be very fascinating for our listeners, the idea of leading in a difficult context. So for example, you've got a children's choir in front of you and you might have one or two children who aren't just not engaged, but might be having a negative impact on yeah. the, the children around them. Is there, is there something in that, in, in that context or is there a way of dealing with that that you found has worked well over the years? Well, I learned early on in my teaching career that proximity was a great help, kind of moving toward that child and then being able to bring them alongside. So, I mean, it's as old as dirt, but the idea of, of engaging that child as a helper to you, not so that you make them, um, you're not rewarding them for their behavior, but you have to find a way to bring them alongside. You've got to find something they're interested in, something they can be helpful with. You know, maybe they just don't want to sing or they're afraid to sing, but if we're doing something with ORF instruments, maybe they're going to be terrific at keeping an ostinato. Mm -hmm. And then once we get them in there, then we can begin to bring them along with the other things because other kids need a turn doing that as well. It's interesting you say that because many years ago, um, when I was in the early parts of my conducting career, I uh, called for the help of one of my friend's mothers, who is a retired primary school teacher. Her name is Murren Conway. And I was looking at ways of trying to bring um, positivity to the rehearsal using positive reinforcement because um, I really believe that the rehearsal process should be as enjoyable as possible and how how can you encourage people in an honest way um, when they do something well and, and Mirren is, is she's like a bit of a Mary Poppins Poppins figure but we sat down for a couple of hours and she guided me through some principles and originally I tried them first with children's choirs and you know they worked really really well but I also had a university choir at the time Minute University Chamber Choir and I was like, I wonder, I wonder if this would work <laughs> on college students. If this is the, and it's not necessarily if it would work, but if this mindset, if this approach right. of dealing with this group of people yeah. will work. Um, and it, it really changed how I viewed being a leader. It, it made me far more compassionate. Um, but just, just switching the, the perspective, the lens from, from dealing with things, using positive reinforcement mm -hmm. completely changed how I viewed, viewed leadership. Yeah. Think about how in music school we are taught to deconstruct things, to pull them apart, to find what's wrong. And then if you go into rehearsal and operate 100% from that viewpoint, it is really demoralizing to people. I do not believe that we should ever give false praise, but you can certainly praise the effort. I learned from some good mentors that starting by, by telling people what they've just done well and then building on that, it's the old expression my grandmother used, you know, about catching more flies with honey than with vinegar. Mm -hmm. Just when you're berated all the time, you just lose all your heart for doing anything. And that is the opposite, I think, of what singing and choral experience should be about. Yeah, because at the end of the day, people come, they want to sing. They've already committed. To, if they're sitting in that chair, yeah. they've committed to being part of this. So by, yeah, by berating them, it really has a has a negative impact there's a quote that you use that i think you you got from a dissertation by a person called you mm -hmm. um correct me if i'm wrong 
but this quote has stuck out uh, because I think it's just it, currently with everything that's going on with COVID-19, I think it really highlights the role of the choral conductor. And I say choral conductor because in the context of amateur music making, in the context right. that let's presume that 95% of choirs are made up of amateurs okay. um, uh, and, and what it means to be in a choir right now with all of the, the various social distance thinking with the virtual mm-hmm. choirs, etc. Um, I'll read the quote out here. Uh, I, I really think it's fascinating. Yet our roles as conductors are a combination of musical and non-musical elements. The root word for conduct, conducare, means to lead and to care, implying both. Even conductors of professional ensembles have, quote, greater management responsibilities than their predecessors. According to research by Mintzberg, quoted by you in, 19, in his 1999 dissertation. That, that sums up really what choral music and is about for most people. Absolutely. Well, it's, you're singing with your body and your personality. You can't blame an instrument that you're holding or anything like that. It's you, the person. And when you come in, you're very vulnerable. You're, you're allowing yourself to be. And so, so much of what we do is managing in a positive way the personalities, all the needs of people. Um, that's why it's important. The caring part is so important. The other um, kind of leadership that that you talked about in his dissertation and that I had done some work with before is situational leadership where there's a balance between um, the task and the relationship. So you go in and you're prepared, you know your music and so forth, but the way that you relate to the musicians is extremely important. And if you're high task and high relationship, there's a good balance there. Let's delve into that a bit more just to, to, for our listeners. What do you mean by high task and high relationship? High task is being on the job. So the high task conductor is somebody who goes in, they know absolutely the music, they know what they want to accomplish, they know how to teach it. The relationship is is the way that they engage with the musicians. And so along with that teaching, they're doing it like you were saying earlier in a way that is encouraging, that gives positive reinforcement and so forth rather than berating people. And um, it's a model that came from business and there are four quadrants. The high task, high relationship is the ideal. That's what so-called good conductors say that they um, espouse. But if you think about the opposite of that, low task and low relationship, what would you get? That's somebody who's not engaged at all in what they're supposed to be doing. And they could care less about the people in the room. So in business, that's called laissez-faire or delegating. You're just Mm -hmm. giving everything away to everybody else and not doing any overseeing. Um, sometimes we use a high task, um, low relationship. For example, if you're, if you're, I would use the example, if you're making a recording, say for a publishing company, I remember doing this one, one afternoon at the University of Toronto. We had an hour and we're making a recording for Hinshaw publications. And so the kids had not seen the music before, bring in the music, we sight read through it. I mean, it was just Dr. A is on a tear today and she's going to (laughs) eat his head in a hurry. I wasn't mean or anything like that, but it's just get right down to business and get this done. And within an hour, we had sung it, we had recorded it. I had listened it back. I had said, okay, this is fine. We'll send it to them. But that wouldn't be the normal way of operating because you don't take into account people's personalities or anything. You just get on with it. But it was a case where that kind of leadership was appropriate. That's very interesting because that, that model is, is, I'm sure, really, really vivid for, for people. And, and actually, it's something that everyone can relate to, whether it's their, their own work or their own musical performance or whatever it might be. But, but when you're under pressure, so say you've got that recording session, you think, okay, this needs to be done. I need to get this done. It needs to be a really high quality. So, right, let's go, everybody, you know, just yep. focus for this. Mm-hmm. And it's very easy to have that high pressure as your norm and we know as musicians and freelancers and performers that you know we put ourselves under a lot of pressure so the difficulty is maybe i don't know easing the pressure somehow or letting yourself um bring that relationship in and to value the relationship and to bring that up as like you said high uh to to both have that same level and 
it's prioritizing and valuing both as the norm and i think right. that that's probably the most difficult thing for people who really are under a lot of pressure that's a great point. And I think it's also the model of the autocratic conductor, you know, mm. decades ago, where the conductor was boss, um, maybe male, <laughs> dominant, um, coming in and just sort of taking over and wouldn't even know the name of the people in the to some, that, that might be the norm for, for a lot of sort of models, yeah. like you said, sort of yes. the form in which it exists. Right. And I perhaps think. that model attracted certain types of people are to the job yeah like maybe maybe if you're in the orchestra and, and that suited your way you're thinking right well, this is this is how i, I enjoy I can, eating i can be a conductor so i should be a conductor right. kind of thing yes yeah. dangerous dangerous road <laughs> because, <laughs> says the conductor <laughs> <laughs> well i it's funny like when you when you reflect on on your career as a conductor and like i remember my first year i was very very young to get the job I, like mad but I was 21 when I first conducted the Newt University Chamber Choir and I was just extremely lucky fortuitous etc but I was the same age if not younger than some of the people I was conducting right so in my first year I I, I decided I am not going to take any uh can we can we swear in this podcast no, no, it's <laughs> um so I'm not gonna we're, we're talking to a Canadian we definitely can't swear <laughs> So I decided, you know what, I'm going to be like, everything is going to be really, really tight uh, yeah. and no messing around. Rehearsals are going to be tight, very process oriented mm -hmm. rehearsals, very, you know, we're here to get the job done. Here right. we go, get through the music. And while the, the, the end result that year, well, there's a couple of other challenging things about the year, but the end result of the year was quite good. The choir sounded really, really great, but the, the process didn't necessarily instill the best um, mm -hmm. the best level of kind of reward for, in terms of you know the singer's enjoyment of the right. of the rehearsals. Now there were other issues where there were six people in the choir who went for the same job, uh, so so there were six people there thinking that they could do a better job the entire time. That didn't help either, <laughs> but but nonetheless nonetheless um, it was very process oriented. And in your right. book, you also talk about transformative leadership and mm -hmm. transactional leadership. Mm -hmm. And it would be great just to, because, because we're after going down um, situational leadership, it might be good to just, just delve into them a little bit more. Transactional is a little more process oriented, but transformational we tend to think relies more on the personality of the conductor. And I think we've all seen those situations where I remember seeing it with student teachers when I was early in my own career as a supervisor, um, where you would have these personalities that would go in the room and every kid in the room just sat right up and paid attention. There was something um, sort of mesmerizing about them. And it didn't matter if they were prepared or not for the first few minutes. Everybody was right there. Then they'd usually see through it if there wasn't much substance. Mm -hmm. but, but that type of leadership often relies more on the personality. I'm not saying that it's a negative thing, um, but it's a very strong kind of personality in that. Charisma. Yeah, yes. You know, I had a psychologist explain to me once that charisma is a negative. He, he said we should be using the word charm, which I thought was really interesting because he said, look, if you think about it, people like Hitler, people like Mussolini, and we have lots of people today, they, they had charisma, which was a, a negative kind of thing. Charisma in our society is used as a for most of us think, oh, that's, a, a, that's a, a good thing. It's what really engages people. But the psychologist said, no, it really isn't. It's charm that engages people. Mm. And I, you know, maybe it's semantics, but it, I've always thought about that. Um, so I, you know, I, don't, I think I don't want anybody ever to say I'm charismatic, mm. <laughs> which I don't think they would because that's not my personality. But it would be okay to be charming, I guess. Fascinating. It, and it also goes back to the whole idea of, of leading by example. At the end of the day, people, as you said, those very, very charismatic conductors would get up on the podium. But if they're not prepared, if they haven't oh done the work, they have everyone for the first for the first yep. minute. But as soon as everyone realizes they can't, they're, they're yep. missing everything, then they turn off. I'm really interested in... Sorry, Harry. I'm really interested in uh, etymology, like where words come from. And just talking about charisma, it's, it's the Greek and it's sort of this uh, idea of favor or grace yeah. so this attracting people through the graciousness or, or this sort of perception of grace 
But then the word you use, charm, like, you know, charmed has a connotation, almost like a magical thing yeah. where we can cast a spell on someone. Like the and sirens, I, the sirens charm. Right, exactly. right. And I think that's a really important way to look at it because when you said, you just said when someone walks into a room, everyone just follows them. And we all know people like that. A lot of yeah. people end up as performers or, you know, bands or, you know, front, front people Definitely. in like huge groups where they walk on a stage and like 60, 80,000 people just want Everybody. to see them. Yes. And that's, that's charming. That's mm -hmm. just like, so there's something magical happening there. We don't really know what it is scientifically, yep. but we all feel it. And I think that's, it's a really good way to, to maybe look at it and to think of this, this idea of the leader or, or the conductor. Mm -hmm. You have to think too, though, and this is interesting about in that kind of circumstance, some people are, um, they seem to be gifted with that ability, but we don't want to think that leadership is not teachable because it is teachable. And, you know, there's an expression, oh, he's a born teacher or she's a born leader. Some people do have those characteristics. I think that firmly, but I also am a great believer in the fact that you can help people become better leaders. There are tools and skills and so forth that they can have. Otherwise, we'd all be out of business as teachers. I mean, isn't that what we're trying to do all the time is help mm -hmm. people? become better teachers or better musicians so there's change that takes place and I think that um, I've seen very very shy uh, unconfident if that's a word people mm -hmm. become really strong teachers given the encouragement given the tools it can happen but then on the other hand you know there are those people that just seem to have everything going for them too but, but in a way, that first person you talked about is the person who has benefited the most from that teaching because they have transformed. So it's right. almost lived experience for them. It's lived a lived lesson, which, you know, we all know those people who have yes. completely, maybe they've, they've ended up doing something that no one ever thought they could do. Exactly. And they can be brilliant teachers because they know what yeah. it's like to, to learn. It goes back to the singing teacher, mm -hmm. the, the, the singer who always opened their mouth and produced a beautiful sound, the singer yeah. who the technique was, was always there. And no matter what teacher they had, they were always going to develop. They only don't know what it's like to learn. Yeah, right. they had to that's learn. exactly right. I had a colleague one time, um, I was teaching in a school where there were two choral conductors and he had perfect pitch. And so I remember him saying, well, I never had to learn to sight read, so I, I can't help these people. And I thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know if it was easy or not, but I thought, well, I can help them. <laughs> I don't have perfect pitch. But it was interesting because they, he struggled to understand why when they picked up a piece of music, they couldn't just read it at sight. Wow. I can understand why they could. <laughs> oh, <it's> me too. <laughs> and there's some similar things with language teachers as well. So, I mean, as native English speakers, we weren't taught English in the same way that, you know, in, in the sort of, um, in terms of grammar and the, the intricacies right. of the language in the same way that you might learn Latin or Spanish or whatever. Yeah. So sometimes like uh, the Northern Europeans, Scandinavians and Germans and Dutch, they you know when you're in Europe uh, you, they correct your English <laughs> because you're not using the correct tense or or you know conjugation because yeah. they've learned it they've learned yeah. it and we haven't had to learn it because we've right. just inherited it so I think that's a, that almost if you translate that into music mm -hmm. that is often the case mm -hmm. yeah and now to move to, to Canada, because all of our listeners, um, of course, they know where Canada is. We love Canada and Ireland. We've been sending people to Canada for 200 years. <laughs> and, and you'd know well about that living, uh, coming from Nova, Nova Scotia. Scotia. Oh, yeah. my goodness, yes. Yeah, I actually, I actually grew up playing the bagpipes. Um, and there's, oh, plenty of, there's plenty of bagpipes over in Nova Scotia. Oh, yes, plenty. And Scottish dancing. My sister used to take lessons. And yeah. Yeah, oh, great. It's good fun. But in Canada, um, as I said earlier, the, the choral scene in Ireland seems to have just completely um, you know, exploded over the past 15 years um, due to probably the internet, due to more training, due to uh, popular figures like Eric Whitaker, mm -hmm. music by Lauritsen, um, the music became kind of, for younger people, more tasty on their ears, easier to listen to perhaps. Television had a big impact. Television. There's a few television shows and TV yeah. personalities have yeah. brought it into the sort of the mainstream. So how, how has it, has there been uh, a big change in Canada over 15 years or and what is the, the current situation like in Canada for choral music? 
Canada has a, a really healthy choral scene, um, particularly with children's and youth choirs. And they've always had a lot of those, but Toronto Children's Chorus, which was founded, gosh, I think it was 40 years ago now, Jean Ashworth Bartle, she really got a movement started there. And then the founder in the States was Doreen Rao, who brought great um, visibility to that. But what happens when all these young people grow up? They have to have somewhere to sing. So not only many children's choruses, but um, youth choirs are very strong in Canada now and community choruses. So I saw a statistic not long ago that said that there are more people singing in choirs in Canada than there are playing hockey. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, but it's, it, in the schools, it varies somewhat because um, the education system there is run by the different provinces. So some provinces have a stronger music um, commitment, I should say, than others. But in the communities is where you'll find these choirs. And they're often very good about scholarshiping kids, helping kids come into them um, if, the, if the money isn't there in the family. So, I mean, it, it, Newfoundland is just choirs everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, Nova Scotia in the rural areas. The town that I grew up in is still going strong as a, a 10,000 people. I don't think it's added a single person since I left. It's the same population all the time. <laughs> <laughs> always have these wonderful music teachers and, and children's choirs. Um, every province but one has a strong choral federation now. And then there's kind of um. There's a national organization called Choral Canada, which is run, you know, with maybe one and a half full time people, but volunteerism galore. And, and there's this network. It's intriguing to me when I went back and lived there again to, to realize how connected that Canadian choral network is, despite the geographical distance, mm. you know, people from Newfoundland to British Columbia. Um, but they're very connected and especially now through Facebook and all kinds of things in the organizations. Um, so I, I, I think they're healthy. I think they're very worried about COVID who isn't, but mm. they will come back. There's no question about that. And it, of course, Canada is, is just a huge, huge state. And you have your own sort of, like you said, federal or regional yeah. um, groups. Provinces within, With, yeah. Which is the province with without the agency that you said? Which... Oh, it's Prince Edward Island, okay. which is very, very small. And yeah, I'm yeah. there. I I've been there, actually. I, I performed three there. Years ago. Yeah, There's, there are some choirs there, but it's just a very small population. So they often will link up with Nova Scotia okay. to do like their youth choir. They combine um, Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia. And can I, think I ask, that... Hillary, is oh, there a yeah. sort of a distinct choral identity because obviously Canada has several identities it has several yeah. cultures it's multicultural um, yeah. historically in that sense is there a difference in how that manifests in terms of the province uh, the provincial choral maybe structures or sounds sounds or even like how they identify as choral singers or or not choral singers maybe more of a group singing or I suppose I'm thinking of a, a sacred um, mm -hmm. sort of church singing well, you know, like everywhere now, the influence of sacred music was very, very strong in Canada at the beginning as it was in the United States, but particularly in Canada, and a lot of those people came from the British Isles. Mm -hmm. um, they brought the organist choir master over, yeah. and then after the war, they brought a lot of, say, band masters who came and also had some vocal skills. But that is on the wane, um, church attendance and so forth. Uh, what you find is a lot of especially in the East Coast, community singing, the kitchen parties, all that kind of thing. There's great love for that, going back to the old traditions. Um, I would say in terms of sound, the Canadian sound, I found it a little different from the American sound. I think it's still a little bit influenced by the British um, tradition of, of clarity and purity in the sound. Um, when I, when I went back to Canada in 2010 to teach, I was struck by the difference in color I heard in the professional choirs in Canada from what I had been listening to in the States. Um, you certainly can find equivalents. I mean, you can look in Minnesota, for example, very clear, not a lot of vibrato. Mm -hmm. But it seemed to me as if many of the choirs I was hearing in Canada 
use that aesthetic. And I began to think it must have something, it's some holdover from um, the British mm. tradition. It's a preference, particularly in the upper voices for less, less vibrato. And it absolutely helps with tuning. No so point. you've described that, that kind of Canadian sound as a more British, I think you used pure, this sense. Uh, and what's the opposite? What's the uh, like American sound, if you would describe Just it? Just a, a fuller, a little more soloistic timbre. Mm. Okay. Um, but now that's not, that's not the same all over the States. I mean, there are places, if you listen to a group like Consperare, for example, with Craig Hella Johnson, you'll hear those are all solo singers. And sometimes in the repertoire they do, the sound is quite full. And then there are other times when the sound is quite even and very little vibrato. It's a, it's a color awareness, I would say. But um, my Canadian friends will just, <laughs> no, I don't want to offend anybody. Um, <laughs> I, I think I realized that after I had lived in the States, I had sort of, as we all do, I had kind of created um, an amalgam of sound preferences mm. I tend to change the color based on the repertoire and so forth. And I, I tend to go with a little less vibrato than more, especially in contemporary and Renaissance and those types of things. And you'll certainly find American choirs like that too. I think it's really fascinating because yeah, within America, we had Dr. Joe Michael Shelby on and we talked about the, the six, there's a book. Yes, the schools. The six, of the six yeah. schools of, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but the American thing is interesting because I think a lot of it came from, it was, it was driven by the vocal ped world um, because there was a period when people were teaching voice where it was perceived that there was only one healthy way of singing and that was opera. Right. And if you were in singing opera, you were going to shatter your voice. So yeah. it's impossible to do music theater. It's impossible to do Irish shanos. Um, you'll, don't you'll, sing in choir. Yeah, and don't sing in choir because mm -hmm. straight tone is, is, is detrimental mm -hmm. to your voice. Now, straight tone is detrimental to your voice if you're singing FFF and you're trying to hold a super high note. Absolutely, it's detrimental. Right. But it's not detrimental to your voice if you're singing in a healthy way and you're not pushing it. But I think right. the, the idea was that, you know, if you've got vibrato, your voice must be free, which mm -hmm. is like, <laughs> it's just, uh, have you ever heard vibrato that's not free? There's plenty of vibrato that doesn't sound, <laughs> sound very free. Yeah. And it appears that across, across the US, like I know, I know at USC, um, the sound there is, is very much, a, is very bright forward mm -hmm. sound and is mm -hmm. not, not as heavy or weighty as oh, say no. in other parts. Maybe the Midwest probably has a weightier sound, would it? Right. And some I've heard on the East Coast, but I thought that sound at USC was very vibrant and healthy and um, it's a beautiful sound and suited the repertoire. Yeah, yeah, and, and then at the end of the day, it really does depend on, on what you're singing. I won't right. say which choir this was. This is a little anecdote, but I took Minute University Chamber Choir on a world tour back in 2015 or 2016. Mm -hmm. And we did China and we did a bunch of places in America. Oh. And one of the places we visited, um, the really, really famous American conductor there, and we sang for them. And we had the choir, the average age of the choir was 20, 21 years old. So we had a 20, 21 years old sound. And we did like contemporary stuff, uh, Busto and some Renaissance, polyphony, whatever. And then the choir we were singing to was made up of kind of grad students and undergrads. Uh -huh. And they mm -hmm. sang some Bach. And we were in this big, big room uh, facing each other. And we sang our piece, we kind of surrounded them and it was, it was, it was lovely or whatever. And they stood up and sung Bach and like, I don't have long hair, but if I did, <laughs> the hair literally would have been, would have been right the way back like this. It was, it was like Bach a la Verdi. It was incredible. I've literally, I had never heard so many voices sing that loud in my life. <laughs> Just and like fact, a big wall of sound. Yeah, the fact yeah. that it was Bach was it was irrelevant. It was just it was just the and, my, and the students that my students were just like, oh my god, that was amazing, and it was like, oh crap. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. But the, the repertoire choices is really really is is key because you you tailor oh, your, your yeah. sound to and for the, the age of your students, for the background they have, um, I remember having heated discussions with a colleague about whether or not these students I was working with were ready to do big choral orchestral works like Verdi Requiem or something like that. Uh-uh. 
these were first and second year students and some of them had barely sung before. That's mm -hmm. not where you start them. You know, first you have to learn how to use the voice and then um, you just don't go in and sort of put on the gas pedal and, and go. And when so, you think about the male voice, like some oh males God. only get their, the voice only starts breaking at 15, 16. Right. So their actual, their modal singing voice is they've had it for two years ish. Mm -hmm. So coordination wise, you know, oh if, you, if you add that much weight to the folds, right. it's, 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 yeah. And particularly men or, or tenors and basses, should I say, mm -hmm. um, tend to be heavier. They want that big sound. They want to sound oh. big and heavy. So they, they, yeah, they muscle, <laughs> muscle the sound out. Right. Right. So the, we were trying to figure out a few different things in regards to Canada and America and having a Canadian president as ACDA. Um, how did that go down? And as a, as a female president of ACDA, um, how did they deal with, with, with a Canadian Yeah, what's, what's that relationship like between Canadians and Americans? <laughs> Well, now what kind? Are we talking political or, you know? Well, no, let's say, uh, let's say, say away from that. singers, yeah, let's um, say the singing world. You know, I will say that um, I spent most of my career in the States. That it wasn't by design that it was happenstance. I got in places where I liked it. I stayed um, and I was extremely welcomed. I started in North Carolina and you've never seen a more friendly group of people than those people mm. in North Carolina. I'm still friends with some of them now. And uh, just wonderful musicians and, and the whole thing was about music making. And so I remember that when I was elected that Gene Brooks, who was then the executive director in his column in the Coral Journal put something about the first Canadian um, president of ACDA and I sort of laughed to myself and I thought yes and a non-American citizen because I'm still <laughs> a Canadian citizen. Um, I don't think it bothered people one way or another. I think they needed somebody to get the job done and I worked very hard and I had fabulous people helping me and we got through the time. But I learned a lot at, because I did get to travel a lot uh, during that time. That was when I got to go um, be with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir and make a recording with them and, and be in all different parts of the country and meet so many people. And they all just want to make good music. And is there, is there a good bridge there between Canadians coming to the ACDA International Conference every two years? Is that yes. a thing? Yeah, it is a thing. And what's really interesting is that the Canadians always have their own reception. And so you'll find a <laughs> their own party. <laughs> exactly. um, yeah, and a lot of Canadian students have gone back, you know, back and forth over the border. I had some Canadian students when I was at the Ohio State University who came because at that time there were not always so many choices. For example, there are not a lot of doctoral programs in Canada. So once you've sort of exhausted that, if, you, if it isn't a good fit for you, you end up going to the States. Um, I, I don't sense a competitiveness at all. And I think right now everybody's in it together. And mm -hmm. I notice a lot of exchange on Facebook, the webinars that are going up, people are watching from Canada, from the States. It doesn't matter. We're just all looking for the same, you know, answers to the same questions. Yeah, and the EU have just closed down borders to US citizens, which is uh, another another pretty, pretty sad I thing. I was very I lucky know. that my girlfriend just got over two oh, weeks ago God. or a week ago. Uh, just before they close it down to U.S. citizens, but the this this the fact that the cases I saw recently, do you remember the the post um, that there was a, a choir of about a hundred people? Oh yeah, Dallas. In Dallas. Uh, oh yes, on choir, Sunday. Oh my God. Yeah, that sang no masks while they were and they were quite close together too. It's very scary. And Texas is one of the states where the numbers are going up so much now. It's still going up, yeah. yeah. It really, really, really is it really, really is frightening. It's very one frightening. Of, yeah. But one of the great things that it's given us is it's it's given us a whole new way of teaching and it's focused as a teacher, it's given us yeah. new perspectives because all of a yeah. sudden when you're teaching on a Zoom call you have to be whatever we always thought we had to be super clear and it was always you know how clear can dr shy would say five words or less right um but but on a zoom call to keep people engaged whew, different level and like you were saying hillary we've all been listening to each other more like it doesn't matter if you're in the same right. country or if you're listening to 
uh, you're on a call with people halfway across the world right. actually people are re reaching out to each other right now and maybe could you tell us some of the things that you've learned you know from obviously all your research is is very useful right now for people to to, ha to know how do we keep going how do we lead people through this and how do we keep choirs vibrant through this i mean what are the things you've learned recently i have learned that one of the things that matters most to people is the community and so, you know, at the beginning, people were all trying to do Zoom rehearsals. <laughs> it was so frustrating. I have a neighbor who's in a church choir, and she said, oh, we had the most ridiculous rehearsal last night, and nobody could stay together. And, and she said, finally, we just gave up, and we just talked. And that was at the start. That was, I think, in late March. And she is correct about that, that people want to connect. Um, everybody wants to make sure everybody's okay. We're finding better ways of doing things in small groups. Some people have been so effective about teaching musicianship skills and things like that. Um, I'm doing um, a seminar next week for a group of church musicians in Canada where one of the things we're going to look at is how we can use text in our choral music to explore as devotional means now. When because you know lots of times we're so busy with the singing and just getting the notes we don't really think about the text here's our perfect opportunity to do this and to think about ways of getting back in what do you do with this hymn when you have to keep it simple because before we've always done it with the eight part divisi and everything else <laughs> i think we're having to be creative i think we're having to be flexible um and i i'm learning maybe a little late in life that the musical excellence is not always the primary goal. Yes, we want it to be good, but right now we have a lot of other things to balance. And for us as leaders, I think we also feel like counselors, coaches, all those kinds of things now. Um, I just did a, a keynote address for the Ohio Choral Directors Association on leadership in in challenging times and I had so many people connect with me afterwards and say oh thank you for saying and they pick out one sentence because they're all looking for something and I don't have all the solutions but I know that we are a very resilient group of people and that as long as this feels now this is a relatively short time in our life span and that we will come back some of the things I think we've learned too we're going to keep I think we're going to come out of this because it's not just it's not just COVID. It's the whole thing with George Floyd and the racial um, injustice and so forth. I think we're going to come out of it with a different approach to programming too, which mm. is well overdue. Well, absolutely. Overdue. And there's so many things in there, and and oh, this con co this conversation will will just continue. And I suppose that's part of this this choral series on on the podcast is to have these kind of conversations because we are going through. A change a cultural yeah. shift and we're doing it together because we have mm. to um which is good it's you know, positive why absolutely. would we have done that before except we were forced into it so there's the good outcome mm. of some pretty hard times well thank you so much hillary it's been a real pleasure to to meet you and to speak through like, always fascinating topics and um really appreciate your time as well Thank you so much. You could have easily done done another hour there. Double, delve, double delve in into stuff. <laughs> I'll have to get you over to Ireland at some point, Hilary. That would be fun. And you can show us your Scottish dancing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll show you ours. You give me a lesson on the bagpipes too. <laughs> yeah. Listen, thank you so much. And we'll be thank in touch. We'd love to get you on again sometime in the future. Okay. Sounds okay. great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.